for a minute. Good afternoon, good evening Zambia and good morning uh, Canada, good morning uh, other parts of the world. Um, it's quite interesting, when you come live, you think it's evening in Zambia, uh, uh, early evening in the United Kingdom, but other people are literally just waking up. Um, welcome to TV Bakwetu and my name is Linda Banks and as you can tell, to my right hand side, I have a special guest in our midst, and he's um, I just refer to him as a former disgruntled youth, <laughs> Mr. Nawa. Welcome to TV Vakweto. Thank you, Linda. Thank you for having me, and uh, good evening, good morning, viewers. And it's a pleasure to be here. Fantastic. Now, um, viewers, if you're just joining us, I just want to request that uh, you share this broadcast to at least five people. Tag your friends. It was an exciting one. You've had so many questions and uh, these questions are going to be answered today. Um, so if you can share to at least uh, five uh, people and uh, tag your friend, call Call your neighbors, call everyone uh, as we get started. Now, in today's program, obviously, I've been joined by this incredible man who I stumbled upon accidentally. Well, so I thought at the time, I stumbled upon him accidentally um, on social media. And it was about, uh, I think, just over two years ago. But lately, uh, I think maybe perhaps six months into the relationship, I discovered that that wasn't an accident. It was uh, a collision with destiny. Mr. Nawa, do you remember how we met? Yes, uh, quite vaguely. I can trace the footsteps. I know that we started inboxing and then you were interested in a coaching program that I was doing for entrepreneurs. I think it was called Side Hustle. And you wanted to uh, sponsor some young people into the program. And that's how we got to talking. And uh, before you knew it, uh, young people joined the program and then many, many other great things followed. And it's just been a wonderful, amazing um, uh, relationship and friendship. Yes, um, and that friendships, uh, as you refer to it, has uh, brought about young people who've gone on to do incredible things. As I was chatting to you in the background earlier, one of them is this amazing young lady who uh, makes kitchens in Zambia. And with your program, with your teachings, with your mentorship, she's harnessed everything that you taught her and expanded her business. And another girl who is uh, a teacher by profession, she's a young lady, and she's a single parent. Actually, I just, I was so proud to watch her on KBN yesterday being interviewed. So that was uh, pretty impressive. Um, a final boy that actually sent me a message. Um, he's an orphan and he was responsible for looking after some of his siblings. He sent me a message saying, uh, two years after he had been on your program that I just wanted to give you feedback to say that the teaching helped me so much. I've now started a small business and I'm sponsoring my uh, siblings uh, to go to school and I've got a you know an income and helping other people and I was so proud. Well, thank you very much. Louis Pasteur once said that fortune favors the prepared mind. And sometimes those of us who are in the mindset transformation business, those of us who feel like um, our own personal experiences can shape the future experiences and expectations of others, sometimes even us don't have an idea how much impact we have literally on other people. So, I mean, when you reached out to me, of course it was a casual reach out, but here we are down the line, you sharing testimonies and experiences of young people whose lives have become dynamic, financial statuses have changed. And I think this is an example of literally what Africa ought to be doing on a larger scale, changing our mindset, understanding that there is no luck that will come without effort, that you know we have to keep pushing, we have to keep uh, being dynamic as a continent, as a people, and overcome any mental, psychological, physiological barriers that may come our way. 
That is true. Uh, now, before we get started, I can see we have over 400 people who've literally just joined us, which is great. And don't forget those uh, stars, please. Keep sending those stars, which will be amazing because that's how TV Vapid runs. Now, Mr. Nawa, um, I have experienced you as this incredibly devoted father, but I hear there's a gorgeous chick on the horizon. Social media um, has been awash with uh, matching oh, oh, oh. pretenders. I'm, I'm, I'm losing you, Linda. Network is not so good. What, what did you say again? <laughs> That's the best time to lose network, I said, Linda. <laughs> I, I know it's raining in Zambia, but the network is perfectly fine. <laughs> what a wrong time to be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, would I be no. right in uh, chiming with the rest of the nation and saying congratulations on the impending nuptials? Well, thank you very much. Um, the, the nuptials are just around the corner, the formal nuptials. Uh, but indeed, there is a very special person in my life. Um, it's been quite a journey for me and with all the, the tumbles and, and the hula baloos, the mountains and, and valleys over the past maybe five to six years, um, finally to be able to have a friend and a partner and someone that you can share great destinies with, somebody who can understand the greater complexities of our lifestyles. Some of us are not sedans or saloon cars, we are uh, semi-detached truck and trailers. I mean, we come with baggage, honey. And so to have someone that really understands you, you gel with and supports you fully, it's mm -hmm. such an amazing feeling. And um, of course, we are really excited and absolutely humbled and to be able to tie the nuptials. We're in the pre-nuptial stage right now and we're very, very excited about it. That is fantastic. Uh, personally, I'm really excited for you. It's, it's really exciting. Kids, small kids, perhaps on the horizon? The typical African. Well, and you start well, asking for kids you, before the nuptials take place. Sometimes we carry a cooler box, then we hope to buy the ice along the way. So we'll see how much ice we can put in the cooler box. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a very prudent way of looking at things. Uh, now, Mr. Nawa, you are or were referred to as a disgruntled youth who resorted to escaping into the bushes with, um, to borrow honorable or di the dishonorable Lusambo's phrase, Nama musicians. The youth Nama musicians, you resorted to escaping to the bushes. Now, is was that um, um, just attention seeking or you had an appointment with destiny? Um. To call it attention seeking would be both right and wrong. It would be right in the sense that we sought the attention of the government to give us an opportunity to express ourselves. And this was in the midst of uh, political threats, gagging of the media, arrest of young people. I mean, we had a young man who, and a friend who had gone to seek permission from the government at central police to seek permission. <laughs> and they were literally arrested for asking for permission to protest. They were arrested and they spent three, four, five days in cells. We had ministers who were saying to us, they're telling the police break their bonds. We had the head of state literally saying we were anarchists uh, mm -hmm. out in Chiru. And it was a very difficult time. And I remember on the actual day of the protest, by the way, the reason we went to the bush was actually to divert attention from life-threatening uh, activities that were planned for us. I mean, we had never seen so many guns on the streets of Lusaka. So we were we were really, really a courageous group, very um, organized, well organized, great people in that team. It was not a one man show. And so we went to the bush. Up to now, the police don't know where that bush is or was, and uh, we've kept it as such. And so we really didn't do it to seek attention. We, do, we did it to fight for our fundamental rights in the Bill of Rights, as enshrined in the Bill of Rights. Uh, freedom of expression, freedom of association, freedom of um, opinion, freedom of belonging. And that's what we did. And um, we are very proud of, of that, that phase in our lives. Mm. And I think it would be prudent to say that uh, that uh, act in itself was quite productive and gave birth to um, 
a revolution, so to speak. Young people finally uh, found a voice and some people were calling themselves voice, the voice of the voiceless. But I think that act in itself kind of just opened up to people being able to speak. So um, I would say it was an appointment with destiny. Wouldn't you say so? I think so. It was an inevitable succession of events. And I mean, uh, when we, we, we did a broadcast on that mountain, which lasted about 45 minutes, uh, 40, 43, 45 minutes, when we were done with the broadcast, literally, our phones were, uh, were burning. Our viewership, we were, just, we were shocked ourselves. And mm. from that moment, I think there was a bigger movement across the nation. And young people were questioning more the decisions of government. Uh, young people were asserting themselves. Even the older people were also speaking. The civil servants were whispering. I think it gave birth to the beginning of uh, a bigger, a bigger thing that I think to this day we are either still enjoying or still experiencing in terms of the awakening of the conscious of the citizenship uh, to be able to 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 ask questions and to want answers. And I think that is a stage at which we are right now. Mm. Incredible. Talking of appointments. Um, you were imprisoned, ridiculed, accused of hideous things prior to the August elections. Uh, post the uh, August elections, uh, people that you were working very close, uh, closely with, uh, for instance, Anthony Walia, uh, has been uh, given uh, a presidential appointment. Um, at that point, what is going through your mind? How are you feeling? You have not received that appointment. You look at your phone, it's not ringing. How are you about that? Trust me, my phone is ringing. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> half the time, the people, the people who bother me a lot about appointments is other people, actually. Sometimes I'll be doing my own thing, minding my own business, and I get, I get a gazillion phone calls from family, from friends, from uh, people in my past, people, just neighbors. Um, I think people are really concerned uh, you know, I like to call a spade a spade. People mm -hmm. are concerned and uh, people are wondering why uh, perhaps what has happened with others has not happened with me. Mm -hmm. And I'm always explaining to them and calming them down. So to answer your question, at that point, what is happening in my head? I'm very happy. In fact, the day Anthony got appointed, I was at State House. I was right there with him, supported him rejoiced for him and stood right beside him as I, as I thanked God that my colleague had ascended to another position and another transition within the dispensation of authority and power. I think for me, my anchorage is in the fact that I have uh, a sort of confidence in who the president is, the kind of person he is and uh, his ways of doing things. I know him. I can proudly say I know him. Of course, maybe not as much as people who live with him in the same home, but I have an idea of his principles and his methods. And, and so that always gives me comfort. And the ironic part is there are times people are calling me, Mubita, why not, why not? And I'll actually be maybe with the president <laughs> as people are calling me and asking me, uh, or I'll be you know, somewhere on duty working and serving. So for me, I'm very excited for my colleagues um, and I, I believe that there's enough room within this country to serve. Let's be very, very clear. I did not go into jail to get a position. I did not. I did not sign up for politics because I wanted a position, not at all. So in that regard, there is no disappointment, except that I'm so happy for my colleagues and I'm still, I still meet them, not always, not often, not as often because they're very busy people and I understand that, but I'm very thrilled for them. Okay. Um, you say uh, you know the president very well. Of course, you've worked very closely with him. Can you just give us an insight? Who is 87? Who is Bali? Who is Hakainde Sami Hichilema? So I'll give you an instance. One day we are at his house. It's just the three of us, uh, myself, the president, and Chela Tukuta, the photographer. 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, I had a meeting with the president prior to Chela arriving. Then Chela arrived and um, we had concluded the meeting with the president. And now we're doing photo shoots with the president, what Chela was doing. Mm-hmm. And as the president was taking this photo shoot, he, he, he looks at his small phone, you know, and then he says, you see, Mubita, they laugh at this phone. It's, it's a very good phone, you know, very good phone. So he has this little phone in his hand <laughs> and he has this big phone on the other side and he's proud of them both, you know, and, and it's just amazing to see him being conscious of some of the things that go on out there. He's very internet savvy. He knows what's going on online. <laughs> very, very savvy. He's, he's, he, he has that sixth sense. So he can laugh at himself together with the people, but still mm-hmm. stick to his principles. And that's the kind of man that he is. Um, another fascinating trait that I've seen on many occasions, whether it was in Impika or whether it was in Serenja when we were being petrol bombed or in Mumba when the police had stopped us from going, wherever we've been, or Kasama when we were being, uh, or in Pika when we were being uh, harassed by cadres of the Patriotic Front, the president is quite, how do I say this so that it sounds presidential? Uh, but I'll say it as it is. He, no, I can't say it as it is because he's the president. But he's quite dedicated <laughs> to persuading people to see things as he sees them. And mm. I think we saw, the, we saw this in the Chipata incidents where he was blocked and turned away from entering Chipata and he stood there refusing to touch the gate because he said, uh, if I touch the gate, you will arrest me. You will find a reason to arrest me. So you open the gate. There was nothing there on the gate by, but a flimsy wire, but he stood there. Uh, patiently waited and negotiated until he went through. That's the kind of dogmatic commitment he has within himself regarding anything and everything. So whether it's, whether it's going into a town where the police don't want him to, or whether it's making a donation when other people are fighting over whose name is going, he's very dedicated. And that passion, that conviction in his mind about anything, and everything is admirable. It's just absolutely admirable. We are coming from uh, Mpulungu, Mbala. We are tired, Linda. Mm-hmm. We reach Kasama. We reach, uh, you know, we're finally in Mansa, 23 hours. 23 hours, Linda. I'm tired. I am just worn out. And uh, I go to the president. We're done with everything. I said, sir, um, I think we're done now. He says, Mwita, we're starting off. I said, sir, to where? He says, to Lusaka. <laughs> you know, and I am like, I'm like, we've been on the road since <laughs> six in the morning, Mr. <laughs> President. This is in my heart, of course. I'm not, yeah, of I'm, course. Not I'm like, what, what, what was that all about? Yeah. And, uh, and I look at him and, and I, I know him when he says, we got to go. Mm-hmm. And at that point, Linda, we had to go. You had to and go. We drove, we drove all night, reached Lusaka around seven in the morning. By mm-hmm. 10 o'clock, you were on a plane going to Mongo for another campaign. Goodness me. Wow. Now, those are quite interesting tales. Um, a couple of things from what you've just said. Uh, him very, uh, very. Uh, T- take his survey uh, that is very true because if you remember they were calling him the facebook president now he's not actually the facebook president he's the actual president and the interesting bit about that um there would a lot of people his uh, opponents would um allude to the fact that uh, he would never rule he would never lead the country he would never enter state house but isn't it fascinating that now they can't wait to get him to state house they're so keen to drag him into state house he's like no i'm perfectly happy here for now i think um you know 15 years in the as opposition leader 23 years as upnd opposition and his 15 year tenure and the multiple times that he lost it made others underestimate him. 
but it made him realize his true potential. And something happened to him in 2016 that shifted. And even the way he handled this campaign mm -hmm. was very, very different. I mean, there are certain things I can't even talk about here because they are privileged information and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. But I think even the patriotic front did not know the kind of uh, background work that was happening within the UPND and the methodical manner in which he, the president of the UPND, who is now president of Zambia, handled this election. He was absolutely prepared. So what and changed? He understood what he had. What well, I'll let, I'll let historians write that. But uh, for those of us who are close to uh, the circles of power and the corridors of power, I'll just give you a small hint. You can be in a room with the president, okay? And there are 20 people in that room. And here I am doing my special assistant duties. He'll come and speak to person A and he'll call them by name, and they'll go into this deep conversation with intricate data and details and follow mm -hmm. up on a previous conversation that could have been a year ago, six, you don't know, you don't know because you don't know, you, you, you know, you don't, you don't know everything about your, your leader. Then he goes to person B and another conversation goes on. He goes to person C, and, and D, and until he finishes all the 20 people, wow. and you look at him, and you, and you look at yourself, you shrink mm. in the stage of greatness. He's like that. Mm. He literally talks to individuals on a personal level. And I think this is what he did on this election. He did not just invest in the bigger campaign. He invested in the personal stories of armor bearers, of mm -hmm. baton runners, and torch bearers, mm -hmm. and relay runners. And, and they held this fishing net together of August 12th, and mm. it did come together. It did come together, indeed. My mind kind uh, finally shifted um, in the Chipata incident that you alluded to. Um, him negotiating, I was thinking, I have a daughter. If I was negotiating Lowola, I would want a uh, Hakai de Ichiluma in my corner. He was so brilliant at talking. Even the police officer who was on Bashtasila's sides that time stood there. You could see he was visibly kind of uh, in awe of this person, just thinking, who does that? President Hakai de is a charismatic man in in a sort of conservative way, you know. Uh, he, he's, he's got this charm about him, you know, that captivates people. I saw this, for those of us that traveled with him on campaigns, we knew that side of him. We were just so glad that Zambia saw it in Chipata. But I'll give you an incident of similar circumstances, but in a hostile environment. Mm -hmm. We are on our way to Kasama to attend Patrick Mucheleka's court trials. And we reach Mpika. We've had hostility throughout this trip. We reach Mpika, about 200 youths wielding pangas, stones, and catapults are right there by the junction. And we're about to fuel. And the president, at that time president of UPND, steps out of the car. Now, you don't step out in the middle of conflict. But then again, that's what leadership does. Leaders step out at critical moments. And he comes out and starts to negotiate with police. A stone comes and hits the vehicle I was driving. At that point, I joined a security detail formation to protect the principal and so on and so forth. He walks towards the direction from whence the stone came and went and negotiated our passage through, he literally rescued us from the jaws of a lion. And that lion was blinded young people who were paid to cause anarchy and harm and danger to fellow citizens. And at that point, I was just like, Mr. President, do your thing now. Let me know when to drive. 
even, if, even if you wake me up in the middle of the night to go to another town, I'm big, I'm game. <laughs> Look, he makes you feel so safe around him, the way he negotiates with people, with women. And sometimes, you know, those of us around him that do work and serve around him, we stop people sometimes because, you know, you got to protect the principle. Yeah. And sometimes he says, no, 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 let them come, let them come. And he's just that kind of a person. Um, and sometimes even when I see certain comments online, it just breaks my heart because I'm like, you are describing somebody you don't know. Mm. Yeah. The um, idea of him being great at negotiating, I think it's something that not even the opposition can dispel. And he has, on so many instances, uh, told the public that he is um, going to be the biggest salesperson uh, for the country. And I, I saw this firsthand when he came to London. And another point I wanted to raise with you, you talked about how he makes you feel like you're the only person in that room. I experienced that as well when I had um, an encounter with him. There were hundreds of people in the room. But in that moment, when you're having a one-to-one -one with the president, it's like you're the only one there. And he focuses on what you're saying and responds accordingly. So that, that that's an incredible skill to have as a leader. He's, he's absolutely amazing. I'll, I'll give you a lighter note, just a lighter note. Uh, I hope I don't get in trouble for this, but <laughs> we are at the recent memorial, you know, um, the Heroes Members Day at uh, Freedom Statue mm -hmm. in Kamwala. And I'm standing, I'm in position and he's just finished greeting diplomats and he's passing by, by me where I'm standing. And he literally whispers to me and he waves like a little wave and says, more bitter, you know? And you know, it's just, uh, <laughs> so the you know, uh, it's, it's just, he's very funny, by the way, the president is a funny, person is up and a great storyteller like he can tell you stories from 30 years ago from two weeks ago uh, but i think more than that uh, on a bigger scale mm -hmm. we've seen those negotiation skills he's taken them to uh, united nations he's taken them to the u.s he's taken them to scotland he's taken them he's gonna take them around the world because zambia needed a leader who who, who, who did not just want to be seen to be leading, but to be leading as he is seen to lead. There's a difference. Some people want to appear like they are on a horse, but they're not riding the horse. This president does not necessarily want to be seen on a horse riding, but he mm -hmm. doesn't mind being on a horse on behalf of Zambia and fighting for Zambia. And I think over the next five years, we're going to see a lot of good deals uh, economically, strategically, uh, alliances, liaisons, partnerships, because that's just the kind of man that he is. And he's very hardworking, by the way. Uh, even before he became president, um, he, he works long hours. He knows how to balance his hours. And uh, he's a very hardworking man who's going to fight for this nation uh, for a very long time to come. Talking about working hard, when he came back from the United Kingdom, he landed at the airport that was arcing his movements. And um, first thing, he's already working, talking to journalists. And we'll pause on that one. I'll come back to that incident of him talking to journalists. Um, straight after that, off he goes to another ceremony. And I remember posting this, uh, saying someone needs to uh, order the president to rest. Literally, there's got to be someone who should order him to rest because he was li literally from America then um, to various different trips that he did. He came to the United Kingdom, just so much going on. And um, isn't there a risk that he might burn up? I think we have momentarily lost Mr. Nawa. And as we wait for him to come back, I will uh, have a chat with my colleague, um, Frank Saliki, on the things that Mr. Nawa has been talking about. Frank, have you been following the conversation? You're muted. 
I've just said a lot of things then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, for me, it's quite interesting. He talks about the human side of, um, of, of our president, mm -hmm. that the amount of details that he has to have. I think for me, it's a great, it's a great attribute in, in, in a leader. Mm -hmm. It is, isn't so, it? It's a great attribute. It's where you go through, do you know your staff? Do you know your people? And being able to do that, you can. You know what your people are. You know who to appoint. You know the strength. You can have different conversations with different people. Mm. And what, what, what interested me the most is he, he talked about how HH would move from having one detailed conversation to a completely detailed conversation. And he's got, it just sounds like he's got so much data on what is going on. His data is not limited. He knows he's got, he's, he's got ideas and he puts himself in places where he can get different opinions. So for me, that, that was quite mm -hmm. interesting to see. And, and some, of it, some of the things that Mavita just explained there, the president demonstrated it. We saw, we saw him when he was negotiating with the police officers. The way he handled mm -hmm. himself, and I remember watching that video, and I thought, "There's leadership." He, he handled Absolutely. it so well. It, it yeah. was that was leadership personified. It was it was Absolutely. brilliant. It was brilliant to see, and 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 you Thank can you. see. I think it, it was a great insight. Thank you so much, but Patrick, you have been following the conversation. Um, what do you think about? Uh, uh, what uh, Mr. Nawa said about the president's attributes. Yeah, yeah, I think what Nyawa, Nyawa, what Nyawa said is is correct about the president. Mm -hmm. And uh, the best example is the Chipata incident at the airport. Mm -hmm. Everybody saw mm -hmm. that. I was watching live and I was so scared what was going to happen there, remembering mm -hmm. what happened in... Um, um, you know, when he was arrested and taken to Mokobeko? Yeah. Yeah. So I was so worried that something like that might happen. I thought it was a trap by the PF because the longer, you know, that took, um, I was getting worried and worried. The next thing I, I saw HH getting into Chipata, that was fantastic. Okay. But then the other thing is um, I haven't met uh, HH uh, personally, like uh, Movita Nyawa. But I've had a lot of meetings with him on Zoom. Yeah. And I, can, I do agree with Bamovita. The stories, HH would tell yeah. us stories up to midnight. And yet we were supposed to be with him only for one hour. One hour. Okay. Let Bamovita continue. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, you, uh, you will come and join us in a little while. Thank you so much for that, for Patrick. Uh, we lost you momentarily. Sorry. Sorry, the network, ma'am. <laughs> That's, <okay. laughs> That's all right. So, uh, technology, uh, it is what it is. So, yes, um, you were talking about uh, HH being this salesman and his characteristics, uh, being able to remember um, uh, details about people and making you feel like you're the only person in that room at that particular moment. Yes, and um, I think just before we broke, uh, you were also referring to uh, the London trip and how he's so hardworking in the midst of all of that. He does an interview at the airport, then he goes to Southern Province to to do uh, to officiate at the ceremony there in Monze. Um, and and then you see him at the airport talking to journalists. <clears throat> and here we were. I was there at the airport that day. We're trying to move him, and he's like, No, 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 no. Let them ask. You know. And the conversation went on. You see him in Monze. He's interacting with people. An old lady comes to him in Monze, grabs him and greets him, and he lets her come. Very personable, absolutely personable, absolutely connected with people. <clears throat> and um, that is something that probably we did not have a whole lot of in the previous government. Mm, that is so true. And also, um, it, I think if you've done quite a traveling you know the trip from london to zambia is such a killer and he traveled on com on a commercial flight so having had that uncomfortable of course he's a president there'll be perks but it's a very long journey 
and he still carries on doing all those things. So that is quite, quite amazing. Now, I want to take you slightly back to the airport. Let's re reverse, rewind a little bit. We go back uh, to the airport when he's returning from uh, the United Kingdom. He has this interview that happens and it goes horribly wrong. Um, I personally was very frustrated about that because um, the president had had a, a very successful trip to the United Kingdom, negotiated so many deals. He had uh, meetings. He was invited to places, to tables that are only reserved for European uh, leaders. Uh, he met Nicola Sturgeon, who is not known for meeting a lot of um, African leaders. So that was quite a success in itself. And then I hear that the only thing that comes from that tweet, a phrase, a click. How did that make you feel? Well, <clears throat> for me, I have seen how the president answers questions, how he responds, and is very dedicated to ensuring that he attends to nearly every journalist. And I mean, Anthony Wilder, who is this presidential spokesperson, I believe will probably <laughs> would be able in a position to share greater detail in terms of some of the ins and outs, the inuances that they go through with the president in terms of determining what to answer and what not to answer to. But I was right next to the president when that, uh, when that came out. And immediately I knew, because I know how journalists in Zambia, you know, with all due respect to you, Linda, and many others, but I feel that journalists, some journalists in Zambia, tend to frame you into a particular corner because they want to get something out of you. And if you're not careful, they'll catch you uh, with something on, on your blind side. And, 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 and in that case, they should have asked about the trip in London, they should have asked about this, that, but they went to talk about something totally different. Uh, maybe it's the member saying, we do not know. Mm -hmm. But um, immediately phones started to ring. I could see people who manage his PR were working and, and over the out and worked out just fine. But I think there was also a bit of lessons in there for me personally, uh, mm -hmm. because when you're around great people, in Nigeria, they say the sun doesn't shine on those who kneel before it shines on those who stand. Uh, so when you're around great people, you watch their shadows from the sun that has shone on their heads and you can learn one or two things. So I'm, I'm enjoying the lessons around the president, how he's managing his cabinet, his staff, his portfolio, his philosophies, his ideologies. And it's such a wonderful lesson plan coming from campaign period to actually... Uh, uh, watching the president do presidency. Of course, I do have a personal problem in my head, and I don't know where this comes from. But mm -hmm. I'll tell you, Lee, every, out of every 10 moments I'm with the president, there's about three or four moments I don't believe my eyes. <laughs> Explain, please. Elaborate. So I'll give you an example. We are at the airport now. He's flying to Malawi. And... I'm at the airport bright and early doing my duties and his motorcade is coming to the airport. The red carpet is laid, the plane is there ready for him to fly to Malawi. And I whisper to my colleagues standing next to me, I said, I still can't believe that he's the president. So there's a part of me, you pardon me, maybe it's the, the combo side of me or maybe because we just went through so much. There's a part of me that up to now, I don't believe that he is the president. I know he is, trust me, I know. But there's a part of me that's just overwhelmed with so much gladness and gratitude that God saved this nation from very, very terrible, terrible leaders. Absolutely. Um, just to add on the point you raised uh, that you were at the airport, when uh, the unfortunate incident happened, when the president was responding to that question. And I was thinking, is it because he's exhausted and he, he was caught off guard? What happened there? I was completely true, but uh, perhaps not uh, 
perhaps it was blown out of proportion. Uh, instead of, you know, uh, focusing on what he had done, he could have diverted that conversation into, you know, let's focus on what I had just been experiencing in London and zeroing in on the success that trip had brought. Now, you mentioned that um, Anthony Walia is, uh, was around and uh, is responsible for speaking, uh, which I think it leads me quite nicely to my next question um, about the New Dawn's media team. Um, do you feel it's misplaced at best playing second fiddle, which appears like um, it's it seems to be catching up with uh, Emmanuel Mwamba's well-oiled propaganda machine. Um, this never used to happen. It didn't happen prior to elections. What do you think happened? Where did it go horribly wrong? That's a loaded question. Um, when you say, where did it go horribly wrong? Um, I'm not sure if you're referring to the PR perception that you hold, or perhaps that the, the PF seems to have uh, an upper hand in their propaganda machine. Uh, so let me answer it from, from what I think is going on in the P patriotic front camp. Mm -hmm. I think the patriotic front think in their heads and they're convinced. I think they think they are still in power. Okay. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just my personal view. They think they're still in power. So they still have an aroma uh, and a cockiness, um, a gregarious, you know, geocentric, egocentric force within themselves that still makes them speak as though they were in power because they had so much power, mm -hmm. so much authority, and like a strong perfume, I feel that the patriotic front are struggling within themselves as they unravel, even though they are calling it rebranding, but I call it unraveling, in mm -hmm. terms of how to speak, how to behave, the decorum of being in the opposition uh, a party, they, they, they were in shock. Uh, and I think that speaks more of the leadership style of President Hakainde Ichilema, which is permissive to the and respectful of the freedoms of expression and human rights of others. Mm -hmm. Trust me, this was the other way around. I don't think uh, Emmanuel Mwamba would be speaking if it was the other way around, or even Boman Lusambo and others. In terms of the PR machine around the president, look, I... <clears throat> I can't comment on that because the president is the appointing authority. And in terms of the structural leadership structure, the organograms of uh, the, the state house and who does what, I am not preview to that. And I would like the people responsible for that to perhaps have an opportunity to answer that. But I would like to make a quick footnote on that, which is at the end of the day, this is our nation, all of us. And mm -hmm. <clears throat> silence is golden, but sometimes it's plain yellow. And I think we, we have to jump in, um, all of us, and, and defend what we fought for, you know, um, and, and fight for what we defended. I think we should all have a voice. Mm -hmm. None of us should have So that the thieves, the perpetrators of violence, mm -hmm. the gassers, the people who robbed this nation of its wealth. I mean, who built uh, 10 million kwacha houses <laughs> and gave them to girlfriends uh, should not speak louder mm. than those who sent the masses. The Bible says the first one to speak in a, in a case always seems right, uh, but that's not the case. Mm -hmm. So I think perhaps we also have to introspect as a nation are we going to allow these people who, some of them have cases mm -hmm. with anti corruption commission, some of them are still appearing in court, but they have the audacity <clears throat> uh, to speak as though they were the ruling party. And, and maybe we need to, to do a rethink in, in that structure. Yes, I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, a rethink in the structure would definitely be ideal. Um, I'm more radical than you, um, Rita. Um, I would say we probably need a little bit of kagamification or magulification. Do you know what I mean when I say that? Because 
this uh, freedom of expression has become rather excessive. And people who should be hiding, hiding under a rock somewhere because they're embarrassed uh, on how they left the country. They left this country in such a mess and they still have the audacity to speak. So I was thinking that perhaps the New Dawn government has left that gap by not being uh, consistent in their messaging, not managing the narrative, but always kind of reacting to uh, conversations that are raised by these people, the likes of Nakachinda and Boman Nambo. Do you think that, that that is a fair assessment? I think um, right now, if you look at even just if you scan the internet and see, I'm, I'm, I am a foot soldier, so I like to uh, have a pulse on the ground and uh, have a clear understanding of what is going on. I think a lot of people are concerned with the freedom that some of these people who committed serious atrocities are enjoying. Mm. And I the law may delay, but it, it, I, I think it should never be denied. Justice must never be denied. And for me, I will be very concerned if these people who looted this economy, if none of them goes to jail, if none of them goes to prison, if none of them doesn't lose their property. I'm very interested in a few people that perhaps bullied me as well during COVID and threw me out of a particular town and asked me to go back. And I'm quite interested. I have a conflict of interest. I want to see them donate now. I want them to, them to show off the wealth they were showing off when they were in power. Um, mm -hmm. Because I know that wealth is not there anymore because it was not theirs in, uh, mm -hmm. to begin with. So perhaps as a nation, we have to um, uh, redefine ourselves in terms of how do we treat uh, offenders? of the previous government. Mm -hmm. To what extent do we, do, we, do we take them? And I think that is a balance that we have to strike along the way. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and at the beginning of the Hichilema administration, I remember the president being categorical on how he's going to ensure that uh, the raw enforcement officers uphold the rule of law and personally the radical linda thought that was a mistake because the first week uh all these people were hiding they were off social media when they lost there were the there was silence, incredible silence. And I was like, right, we're going to have some peace. The president will work. And everyone was rallying behind him to try and ensure that he succeeds. And then suddenly they realized, oh, we stole, but we're not going to be prosecuted. You can't actually spend more than a day in prison, in jail. Um, so they just got on with it, which is quite frustrating. Now, I'm going to take you slightly back to, um, I know you you answered the question quite well, but I'm not totally satisfied when it comes to the uh, the state house media machinery. I I'm really dissatisfied with whatever is going on there. So uh, I'm sorry, I'll have to take you back slightly. I know you are not uh, in the right position to sort of uh, respond fully, but I know you're a very bright man. You give us some answers. So um, <laughs> there has been um, uh, conversations about... Uh, certain people, uh, youths, the former disgruntled youths, uh, some who aspired for the Munali uh, seat, who have been recruited by Emmanuel Mwamba. And now, this is why there's so much noise. I wouldn't want to pay too much attention on that particular story. But I think if we do not touch on it slightly, I think it would be folly because the people who are so disgruntled... Um, in the wrong hands, in the hands of leaders who are angry and hungry for power, and have got a bit of spare cash, that could be awful. I think Zambians have opened their eyes. You know, um, there is always a Judas amongst people. There is always a Jonah, somebody who refuses to go to Nineveh to their mm -hmm. rightful place. Yeah. And there's always a Judas who will betray the cause. Um, but Zambians have opened their eyes. And I, I, I believe with all my heart that the regular conversation is not about who is paying who to say what and 
I think people these days have, um, <laughs> they can read in between the lines, you know. I think what is critical at the moment is a unified voice towards the absolute economic recovery program of this nation, that we render our support 100% uh, towards the head of state. And by rendering our support towards the head of state, it does not say, nor does it dictate that we shall not criticize or render advice to the head of state. Uh, for me, for example, um, I read a quotation somewhere years ago that said, do not criticize someone publicly that you can talk to privately. So for me, I, 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 have, I, have, I sit somewhat in a privileged position. Uh, so certain ideas that I have to share with certain individuals, I share directly with them, uh, including perhaps in my own little sense corner, the head of state, you know. So I, I am a bit in that privileged position. And I think to the, to the general populace, the Zambians, I would also ask that we be a bit patient, you know. <laughs> you know, when you are not the one in the driver's seat, Mm -hmm. Even a small portal looks so big, you know, and even a big portal looks so small that we should be a bit patient, you know. Justice is a bit slow sometimes, but it shall be served. There are some people right now who look happy, trigger happy, money happy, um, position happy, whatever happy they look, um, it's just for a season. Mm -hmm. They are the ones who used to say, Mulan, this wall, meaning a case never goes away or uh, a crime never goes away. Mm -hmm. I think even for them, some of their criminal offenses will catch up. And for the youths who might be used by certain people, mm -hmm. don't look at short-term gains. Perhaps look at <clears throat> your career. Where do you want to be in 10 years? Your political career in 20 years' time. If you look at short-term gains, you just look at a 20 quarter here, 100 quarter here, a post on a particular Facebook page, and you with a few likes, then you are myopic. Then you're not seeing the greater par, part of your future. If Nelson Mandela had sold his heart and soul, he mm. wouldn't have stayed for 27 years in prison. Oliver Tambo, Kenneth Kaunda, Kwame Nkrumah, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, if all these leaders had compromised their ethical fab, fiber, their mm. ethos, we wouldn't be where we are today. And I think some of the young people need to be reminded that political prostitution does not pay. Political immaturity does not pay. We have to seek dignity, leadership stability, and you, you cannot be a rolling stone because a rolling stone gathers no moss. Only you can explain it so beautifully. And immediately I think of an example of a young man uh, who hails from um, Ophelia, Kankoyo constituency. Uh, the last election, previous election, he lost, uh, he didn't get uh, adopted, and he carried on five years later, he was adopted, and now he is the member of parliament for Kankoyo constituency. So consistency and dedication and integrity, more importantly. So if you, as young people, you don't have integrity, you don't have that staying power, you just wishy-washy, whoever throws a few coins at you, um, you you're gone. I think that, that that is not good. That is not good at all. Now, we're going to change trajectory a little bit. Um, and as I let you have a glass of water, I'm going to ask uh, our audience, if you have just joined us, welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, uh, you're watching a special presentation of TV Bakwetu, and I'm your host, uh, Linda Banks, and with a special guest, Movita C. Now, the lousy boy, as he calls himself. <laughs> The one and only Lozzy Boy. Uh, kindly tag your friends, please, if you haven't already done that. I can see quite a lot of you guys are doing that. Now, the interesting thing is our YouTube audience are so generous. They are giving and giving and giving. But Facebook, do not be outshone by, uh, by YouTube. So do the need, please. So be grateful. As we move slight uh, trajectory. Um, I want to take you back to one of the interviews that you just had. Um, and you were talking about um, the government being an anchor 
And, uh, you know, you were, we, you were trying to make an analogy on what is currently happening in Zambia when it comes to the uh, fuel subsidies, the increased fuel prices. I don't know if you remember that. I just wanted you to touch on that slightly. You get some brilliant examples now to some serious issues that, are, that our people are amazing human for the country but um, our people are suffering they're in pain and uh, the increase of a lot of things are going to change obviously the bus fares are going to change uh, the commodities uh, for that poor woman who's ordering stuff from Kusoweto um, things are quickly could you just explain to us slightly uh, uh, um, now and what is the reasoning behind doing it now? Thank you. Thank you, Linda. So um, in 2009, the price of crude oil, crude oil, is a general, yeah, my order, yeah, petrol. You know, mm -hmm. it's the one that comes in bulk. You know, uh, like the way a woman would go to Soweto and buy chiband or chisakacha rep. So mm -hmm. crude oil is shipped from uh, Dar es Salaam into our pipeline to Zama, mixed a little bit with some petrol and uh, uh, low sulfur and so on and so forth. When it gets to Indeni, it's it's filtered and refined. That crude oil was going for $65 a barrel at that time in 2019. And right now, OPEC organizations, or sort of uh, uh, petroleum exporting countries, the crude oil has gone up significantly. It didn't go up four months ago when President Akainde became president. It went up uh, somewhere starting late 2019, early 2020. And the Patriotic Front, in their wisdom, did not adjust the pump price for fear of losing the elections. They were so unpopular on so many things. And they knew that if they let fuel be at the right price, uh, people would be really upset with them. So they prevented what they thought was an upheaval or an unrest. Mm -hmm. So in, in instance, we've been living in a five-bedroomed house as a nation but paying rent for a one bedroom house. And, and, and poor us, we've been enjoying the extra four bedrooms and we have even brought in our cousins, we've even brought in our, we have even sublet some of the rooms, but we have forgotten that we are paying rent for a one bedroom house. Hakainda HDMA comes as our new groom that has married Zambia and he says, to, wait a minute, where am I going to get the money to pay for this five bedroom house? We say to him as Zambians, but we've been enjoying these five bedrooms. Hakainde says, I know, even me, I like five bedroom houses, but we can't afford five bedrooms because your income, your salary is for a one bedroom uh, house. And not only that, your previous landlord or your previous president lied to you that this five bedroom is actually yours when it's actually not yours. And not only that, he has not even been paying rentals for the one bedroom that he was supposed to be paying for. So he owes rentals on the one bedroom. He owes rentals on the extra four bedrooms. And I'm not going to evict you because I'm your new president. I'm not going to evict you, but I'm asking you to adjust your bills to pay for the five bedroom house. Okay. That's the right price for the right bedroom. I know your life will change. You've also sublet, you've got a business to run, the woman in Soweto, but you need to pay for the five bedrooms so that I use the extra money to buy cooking oil for you, to buy food for you, to bring security to the country, to do all these other things. So in simple terms, fuel price has not been increased. Fuel has just been taken back to the normal price. That's the normal price. Now, it takes a good leader to do that. That's a tough decision. Four months into your presidency, you don't want to be messing with people like that. But yeah. he's not messing with people. He's literally preparing people 
to have a good Christmas next year in their five bedroom house, rather than to be evicted by January in, from that five bedroom house. I think that is as a street economics as it can be. Now, mm -hmm. we've all had this uncle or dad who sometimes whooped us, beat us, did something for us, made, forced us to do our homework. We didn't like it. But later on along the years, we're like, I thank God for my uncle. Because if he hadn't disciplined me, I wouldn't have graduated. And HDMA wants Zambia to graduate from a low income, poor income, to a middle income, to a developed nation. But it takes good policies and good leadership. And actually, the PF should be thanking Hakainde HDMA for doing what they failed to do for 10 years. Hmm. Interesting. Um, and I also heard you talk about uh, making comparisons between Zambia and Chile. Could you just speak on that for in layman's terms so that our viewers uh, who are not very interested in the uh, intricates of economy um, jargon can also understand that? I think, I think the, the point I was trying to say between Zambia and Chile is that Chile, though it is in South America, in Zambia, in the southern part of Africa, they are very much similar. They are both copper producing countries. And as early as 1972, they were producing the same amount of copper, 1972. Even in, in, in landmass, they are almost the same. But Chile, over a period of 40 years, 1972 to 2012, Zambia's copper production shrank by 10%. Chile's copper production went up from 685,000 metric tons to 15 million metric tons per what year. Is, what is Linda, it is leadership. It is the same reason why two people can be born from the same mother but one who goes on and works hard and becomes richer and maybe even hires the other person to come and work for them. We have similar resources as Chile, similar. But for us, we don't have similar, or at least we didn't have similar type of leadership convictions as Chile. I'll give you an example. Forget copper for a second. What happened to Mukula tree under the PF government? Mukula business, was a cartel of a man, his daughter, and a few friends. When that money was supposed to be for people in the community, for the nation, in fact, there was such a discrepancy on Mukula that the PF declared, I think 2019, that they had only sold $16 million worth of Mukula to China. And China came back and says, no, 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 it's $147 million. <laughs> That's how bad these people were. You couldn't trust them with your grandmother. So the essence is that if Chile has reduced infant mortality rate, life expectancy, if, if Chile has improved on all these scales using their natural resources, we too can do it. But it takes leadership. It takes making painful decisions. It takes sacrifice as a leader, first of all, political will, and collectively as a nation, which is what we are doing right now. Fantastic. Now I understand you run a fleet of cars or vehicles. I, I don't know what type of vehicles those are. Um, and that's a business. And obviously with uh, the subsidies being removed, high uh, petrol uh, prices, how is that going to impact on your, um, on your business? Uh, it's not going to be easier. We're already feeling it. We are feeling it already. Uh, we just fueled, we, we do, we fuel food tanks every, or three times a week. We do food tanks. On some vehicles, two times a week, but the majority, three times a week, we do food tanks. Now you can imagine uh, one of the vehicles, we used to do a food tank at 880 kwacha at the previous price. We just did a tank two days ago, it was 1,180 kwacha, almost 300 kwacha more. That's on one vehicle. Now multiply that by several vehicles and several times in a week. 
and yet our prices haven't changed. So it's really going to be a, a difficult road ahead. But mm -hmm. we understand that there will be cost-benefit analysis towards this. For example, the stable dollar, the lower dollar rate, means we don't have to buy second-hand vehicles locally that are not even roadworthy. We can now order vehicles from abroad because we have a better dollar rate. And I hope the president, uh, through cabinet and through parliament, can do some supplementary budget incentives along the way for mm -hmm. businesses, such as a, a reduction on import and exercise duty on some of these products as yeah. a way of cushioning entrepreneur. It mm. has to be a 50-50. It has to be a win-win deal. You know, uh, yes, fuel subsidies have been removed, but mm. there has to be some kind of consideration through Ministry of Commerce, Ministry of Finance, to incentivize and to motivate entrepreneurs so that any stronghold economically can be inspired by some kind of, you know, there has to be uh, a gap measure somewhere to motivate and cushion the impact of these changes on the local entrepreneurs. Because once entrepreneurs are suffocating, it means the economy, the productivity, the GDP of the country goes down. And it means that our benchmarks and our targets are not going to be met. That is so true. That is so true. Um, viewers, I will be having a look at your questions. So kindly send pertinent questions for Mr. Nawa. And um, I'm going to add in um, some of our back to our family members. Uh, Mr. Nkwilimba. I believe Mr. Nkwilimba is not here. Boom, uh, Kelebai. Come on, Zivu and Ivana. Ensham to start young, but was trying to call. But was it at the Abuna Utata? We get till a Silami fair one. Well, in the good evening, thank, thank you so much for your articulative. And I think uh, you've just put everything in the right perspective. Um, uh, uh, why so? You have done everything, you have said it all. And I think many Zambians are understanding. They understood completely and they would love. I can see some of the comments that they want you to even go to reach as far as uh, ZNBC and uh, bring out these issues that you've just uh, narrated. Now, now Puzo Yakatate, it's uh, on uh, these chaps that are busy trying to negate the work uh, of the current regime and uh, also the, the lacks of uh, information from the ruling party to the, to the public. There are these two issues which I would love you to look at and what, is, what would be your reaction over the Nenakachinda, the Nemuambas tantrums of, uh, I think they're still having this uh, traumatic uh, stress mm -hmm. disorder. And you can hear they are coming out like so negative. And I just feel so sad to say these chaps have no conscience, even, what, even after what they put us through, they have the odd audacity to come in the media, on the media, and say to the person who is trying to trying to clean their mess, and they want to put him in a very terrible position of name calling. Thank then you. the other issue was the the, the, the procedures, both minister of health, both minister of information and broadcasting. We want to hear her coming out. This is the information that we need, the broadcast, the, the Minister of Information, and the group in the media. Yeah? Now we are missing even Mwetwa now, Mwetwa, Honorable Mwetwa, that issue. Maybe he was misplaced. We want him back to the media. Because we don't see, we only see Anthony being everywhere on the media, as if he's the journalist. But I'm a journalist, my UPND, to come out and even uh, clear out this misunderstanding and put these chaps in their position that they belong. Should not Thank let it to the media. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
Mr. Nao? Yes, thank you so much for Mukilabai. Um, let me start with um, the easiest one there, which is how do I respond to the Nakachindas, to the Mwambas? I think those are already getting the responses that they perhaps deserve from the relevant authorities. The Minister of Information, uh, Honorable Chushi, uh, issued a very thorough statement regarding Mr. Nakachinda. Um, and, and, and I think also in relation to that, you asked me to comment over the Honorable Minister of Information uh, in terms of some communication that you'd like to see a little bit more. I believe that the Minister of Information is paying attention to your comments. I also believe that within the Ministry of Information, there's a lot of dialogue and conversation that we have previewed to. And I think we're going to see a lot of them. Uh, the, the statement she issued over Nakachinda was very good. Um, I liked it personally. I think we're going to see a lot of that, a lot of rebuttals, a lot of pro-agenda and proactive messages. Uh, sometimes also we need a bit of uh, clarity because there are a lot of innuendos out there, insinuations, you know, um, someone who said this one has been appointed, certain information can cause drama and havoc if we don't uh, clarify it quick enough. I think, uh, you know, I think they will, they will need to look at how they can tackle some of that slightly, perhaps a little bit quicker, so that, uh, you know, when liars speak, the people with the truth, when they speak, their truth will sound like lies. That's the problem with, uh, with social media. You have to be a little bit fast as well uh, in responding to that. And in terms of will these people ever be grateful? They don't, uh, they don't owe us gratitude. They owed us integrity, they never gave it to us. Gratitude is the last thing they'll ever have. I think let's also push towards our destiny and mind our business and, and see what God has for us. Fantastic, excellent answers. Now we've been joined by another one of our uh, 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 to family members, uh, Wom Hamad. Welcome to the program, and what's your question for Mr. Nawa? Good evening, Walinda. Good evening, Wanawa. Uh, my question is very simple. Uh, simple in the sense that we are in, uh, on the run to Christmas. It's a festival period, etc. Uh, what is your message to try and bring unification, even with our adversaries? What, how, how would you bring them on board? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Muhammad. Um, uh, this is where I probably could say, Alhamdulillah, I think I'm say, I said that right. I don't know. <laughs> you, you, you've, you've nearly perfected it. <laughs> Thank you so very much. Um, I think the festive season is always a troublesome moment for our country in terms of accidents in particular. Already we saw a very bad accident yesterday, lives being claimed. People get too excited, they over celebrate. I think part of the unification would be maybe a certain sober mindedness towards festivity and uh, maybe a reflection on the peace that we enjoy as our country. Because, quite honestly, in different circumstances and different countries, um, Zambia would have been in a different state right now in terms of uh, uh, havoc and, and, and you know, crime and all those things. So maybe one of the ways we can unify as a people is to say thank you, even for our enemies, even for our critics. I mean, I'm a Bible-believing person. My Bible tells me sometimes pray even for our enemies because by doing so, you are heaping hot coals on their head. And finally, I think we must also learn to ignore some people who are always criticizing us. This is something I've learned uh, being in politics and maybe also serving with Haka in the H -Lema. I've learned to be quiet sometimes, even when some of my critics are talking about me in a negative way. Because if you keep walking, you keep walking, even your enemies will get tired and even your supporters will respect you more for being so focused on your greater goal. Fantastic. Thank you, Thank you so much. Just, just, a, just a small follow-up. Can I just put up a small follow-up on what you mentioned on the fuel increases and anything? I think one point we must make that 75% of the subsidies that were being sub, uh, applied to were going to foreign truck owners and mining companies. I think only 25% were benefiting the Zambians. So I think the, the waiver of that uh, subsidies, you know, in the long term will benefit Zambia because we are we're losing $65 million a day in sub, uh, a month in subsidies. So yeah, yeah. Kudos, kudos to HH. 
Thank you, Mr. Mohammed. Thank you. Great point. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will add another one of our family members, Wong Kwilimba. Now, Wong Kwilimba told me off last time. I mispronounced your name. Come, and I've been practicing on how to say it properly. Uh, what's your comments or question for me, Mr. Now? I think he may be having network problems as well. Um, no, all we... day you have really perfected it. That's, uh, oh. that's how it's pronounced in Quilimba. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, Quilimba. it's good to see Bonawa again um, on this. Uh... Oh, I, I really don't know. I really don't know what's happening because I can hear you clearly. Technology, don't worry. Can, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, can, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Ah, okay, on. lovely. Yeah. yeah, you know, in fact, I started commenting. I was just, um, yeah, I'm just saying welcome uh, one hour to this uh, to this forum. It's good to see you again. Uh, the, the, the only comment, you know, in fact, I've got two comments. Uh, one is uh, to just say um, thank you for your attitude and your commitment to what you do. Um, you know, keep on looking at the big picture, uh, not some of these things that are for now. Uh, we have um, a long haul as a, as a party. We have just started, and uh, we we have five, ten, even more years. So there is much, much more to do, and uh, remain uh, remain focused. Uh, the the second uh, comment really is um, on how focused the president is. We saw that um, when he started a marathon uh, campaign tour, we thought he was just going to end in Kawe. We saw him going on from Kawe to Mukushi to Kapiri to everywhere until he went to all the way to to Mansa um, and back to Lusaka. You know that that's, that that shows how focused he is when he makes up his mind. And I'm glad that he is where he is now as our president. Uh, and I, I want to believe that um, we are going to see great things in the first five years. That will make us very happy, so happy that I would want him to continue for, for, the, for the other uh, five years. Thank you so much for what you do and keep it up. Thank you, Mr. Nkwilimba. Thank you. Those are kind words I really appreciate. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Um, tonight's program has really been hot. I'm trying to add as many people as possible um, so that they can have a chance to ask you questions. Matthew, good evening and welcome to the program. Hello, good evening, my sister. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Your question, please. One hour. Welcome to Akwetu. Thank you, Matthew. I finally made it in life. <laughs> I think so. You've made it. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was wondering when are you going to come around to, because you sort of went incognito and hid yourself from the main scene when before the elections, before the victory, you were much seen around and now you are hiding. I said, where's the general? He's supposed to defend the president and <laughs> get himself in the, you know, take the bullets for him and there's nowhere to be seen to take the bullets. So mm. my, <laughs> I, was, I was a bit disappointed for you, you know, but I think I'm just, I'm just really, that was part of my question basically to say. Where are the generals? Where are the, you know, snipers who are supposed to be defending the president? You know, because I've seen most of the people that uh, I mean, the 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 composition of the army is not an experienced one. I would say. So I took you as one of the experienced generals who is supposed to be in the front line getting the bullets and fighting for the president. But unfortunately, you disappeared. I was wondering, I didn't hear, by the way, I missed out the, the I don't know if my sister asked you, what rank are you now that maybe you are not, you are demoted or you've been promoted to a higher rank or what? So I'll just address you as one hour, or is it a, he's a, he's a deputy, what what are you now? If thank, I may you, ask. thank you, 
Thank you, Matthew. Those are brilliant questions. Brilliant questions. Thank you. So I'll start with um, the last part, which is what is my rank now? Um, I still hold the same rank in the UPND that I held prior to elections, or at least since sometime last year, November November 1st, some of them, my letter of appointment was November 1st, 20, 2020. Yes, 2020. I am the special assistant to the president of UPND for special duties. That's my rank. And to answer Matthew's question, where have I been? Have I been hiding? I have not been hiding. I've been around the president. Okay, those of you that watch the movement of the president, I've been around the president, serving the president in my capacity as special assistant for special duties. However, I was not doing interviews. And there was only one reason why I was not doing interviews. I needed to give our colleagues time to settle in their new positions, uh, those you know that were appointed. That was the only reason, no other reason at all. But I was serving and I'm still serving. You might see me again tomorrow on assignment or the other day, uh, but I'm back now on the media trail, uh, taking answers, glad to be back, glad to be sharing ideas and interacting with the media. I missed it too. Uh, it was not a hiding. It was just, you know, sometimes in life, learn to let the, sh the light shine on your friends. Give them time to settle down, to come out of the flower pot. And once they make like a little groove, then you say, okay, now that you are out of the flower pot, let's do this. So here I am, glad to be doing this and uh, I'll continue to do this. I know Linda and Matthew, I wanna say, Part of the challenge with, with the UPND members, not all of them, but some, is there, there are some whose job within the UPND is to fight fellow UPND members. You know, it's like it's their mm -hmm. mandate just to destroy other UPND members. I think we should be past that. We are the bigger enemy out there. You know, there's an African proverb that says, if there's no enemy within us, the enemy outside can do us no harm. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I'd like Call upon all of us to unite our voices to support our president. He's a great, great, great leader, great father, great uh, family man, and he means well for this nation. He needs all of us, not as a fortuitous benevolent act, but as a patriotic, leadership inspired act. Linda, Peter Drucker once said, Peter Drucker said, managers know what time it is, but leaders know where in time they that is powerful. That is powerful. I was reminded of Les Brown, your earlier quote about the enemy within, fighting, infighting among us, the UPND members. I think it should come to a stop. Perhaps there might be um, a need to have a deliberate policy where something is put in place to try and deter that, because that's quite destructive. If you are killing yourselves within the party, you're opening the whole arena for the enemy to kind of uh, help you attack each other pretty much. So that's really good. I love that word. Um, on uh, WhatsApp, I have just re, uh, received um, uh, a message, a question for you, Mr. Nawa, uh, in your position as a special assistant to the president of the United Party for a National Development. Uh, the chap says, Partisan needs to be strengthened and create new ones in the perceived PF strongholds. Uh, we need uh, the presence of um, of these, uh, including the markets and the bus stops. What is your view on that? So um, I'm very aware, and this is public information. First of all, he is right that party structures need to be strengthened. The reason they need to be strengthened is not necessarily because they are weak. No, you can be strong, but you need fortification. Because I believe that the 2026 battle will be really hard. Um, some of the people who lost the election may want to come back hard, so we need to strengthen that. About bus stops, I'll go with what the president says on bus stops. We cannot go back to bus stop issues. Because every time we go back into the bus stop conversation, Mm -hmm. It's going to fester into another cadarism thing. And the president has been very categorical. We can still strengthen structures in our neighborhoods without going into bus stops. 
Okay, that ship has been and gone. We're not revisiting that. So for the backstop. So the president, he said, no Qatarism or uh, um, whatever you want to call it, because it's it's rephrased. We, know, you and I, know that it's the Qatars who are going to infest these places, but um, they may want to call it something else, building party structures. But just no, no, basically. Okay, um, Bob Patrick, welcome again. Thank you, Bolina, <laughs> and uh, good to see you all now. Huh? Good to see you, Uncle Patrick. Thank you. Yeah, you, you, you've really articulated, uh, you've really explained things very well. I'll be quick. Yeah, but I need to ask you a few questions, but I'll be very quick. The first one is um, obviously the elephant in the room. A lot of people have been saying, one of the foot soldiers, made foot soldiers, the general, hasn't been given a job up to now. And yet this foot soldier is even on Makwetu fighting for the government. He was on um, Facebook the other day explaining about the eggs, you know, in relation to <laughs> the price increase. I so, love those eggs. He's yeah, got but then, then, the, then one hour, we had, we had, we had some, some of them, but who are not adopted, you know, you know, as MPs. And some of them haven't been given jobs. And some of those people, after I was asked that question, somebody sent me a text, asked him one hour about somebody, but I'm not going to mention the name because it's going to be war. But I will just give an example. So they, specifically, they were talking about a lady who are not going to mention the name, wasn't adopted. Now she's frustrated. She's attacking UPND left right center. And then there are some UPND people who haven't been given jobs, but now what they're doing is they're attacking other people who are given jobs or who they think are closer to the president or will be given jobs. So what is your advice to these people? That's my first question. Then the next one, quickly. You've been talking about uh, Cuba and, uh, 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 and Zambia in terms of copper. And I followed that one for a long time. Is it Cuba, the, 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 the copper producing company? I think it, Chile. it's not Cuba, it's um, Chile. 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 Yeah. And, it, and you mentioned, you, you summarized it very well, it boils down to leadership. So, which means, there's been a problem in leadership in Zambia for the past 57 years. So one of the things I've been agitating about is an issue of a national endeavor. Because this problem is not small. Yes, we've got good leadership, we've got good leadership under HH, but don't you think it requires a national effort, a national endeavor? to reflect why did we go wrong? Where did we go wrong? Chile is, Chile is doing well. And find a solution to that. That's my, 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 my second part. Then the, the other part I wanted to talk about also briefly was uh, the issue of, a lot of people have talked about um, our media team. You know, there are problems with our media team. Um, the only thing I've noticed is uh, is that we, we are firefighting in terms of... Uh, and, 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 and this is maybe why the PF seems to be above us, because they're good at pro propaganda, they're good at light. And, and, you know, in football, I like football. In football, they say attack is the best way of... Defense. defense. So why can't it be offensive, attacking, instead of all the time firefighting, defending ourselves? You know, like on the issue of the fuel, we should have been on a fence from even before it, it was announced, explaining to the people why we are removing the substance, but not to, 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 to wait until the last minute. And then finally, on the removal of the substance, on our years, the country, you know, you've explained. One thing I like about UPND government is 
they tell the truth. The other government, Bali Babufi, they've explained to the people why, and, and a lot of people now understand, though we've got other people who don't want to understand. But then going forward, we've removed the, the subsidies. But Godawa, you agree with me. The three factors in, in Zambia that contributes to the to the pump price of fuel are the price of crude, obviously its refinement, the market forces, and also the exchange rate. So now we've removed the, 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 the subsidies. Going forward, the quarter might, might go down to 10. And then uh, crude might go down to 30 per, per barrel. Okay. And then, so don't you think we don't have to wait until the Energy Regulation Board, because this is what happens in the UK. They, they, they don't wait for the Energy Regulation Board to increase the pump price. The market forces, the price of crude, the pound, determine. So what they do is they monitor the prices of fuel weekly, monthly, quarterly, and every year. And, and then the, the Department of Business and Trade which is, under, uh, which is under national statistics, they produce those statistics. That's what Zambia should be doing mm -hmm. on a regular basis, weekly, monthly, quarterly, and then prices just change. So over a quarter, if they see that crude has gone down, the pound is stable, and, 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 and uh, the, 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 the demand is stable, then the price has to go down on its own. I've never seen price of fuel going down in Zambia, even when crude reached it, reached uh, uh, twenty dollars per barrel. Why, Vomovita? Uh, uh, then the other thing, Vomovita, demand and supply. You know that in the UK, diesel is more expensive than petrol because there's more demand of of, of diesel than petrol. While in, in Zambia, it's the opposite. When are we okay. going to reach that stage when diesel Thank will be more pleasure. expensive in Zambia? Thank you. Thank you so much, Uncle Patrick. Um, I want to remind you of one of President Hakainde Ichilema's promises um, and pledges. He said, the UPND and HH plans to streamline the procurement supply and distribution cycle to eliminate extortion by middlemen. That was one of the promises or pledges. That word streamline actually takes into consideration everything Uncle Patrick just said. Um, that leads to demand and supply playing into effect. We shouldn't hate the Energy Regulation Board like that. We should understand the history. There was a time, Linda, mm -hmm. fuel in Chipata was different price, fuel in Livingston was different price, fuel in Akonde was a different price, and that was because the, the market forces were manipulating and sometimes extortional behaviors were applied and people were paying exorbitant prices. And at the formation of the Energy, Re Energy Regulation Board, mm. they standardized. And that's one of, the, one of the good things Energy Regulation Board has done, which is that you can then plan better. Fuel is mm -hmm. the same price as the nation. I believe that the president has a bigger vision on the streamlining part of the whole oil marketing management demand and supply. Uncle Patrick talks about diesel being cheaper, uh, more expensive in the UK. With all these climate change activities, electric motor vehicles, trips of the president to the Congo to look at batteries and lithium and all the lithium energy, who knows the entire petrol and diesel pipelines might not be as high demand. Uh, Firefighting instead of defending. I think we are all waking up from a particular slumber. You know, we've realized that I think if we could just be honest, all of us, we thought the victory of UPND was going to be a kind of sort of a honeymoon of some sort. And we have just realized uh, have you ever killed a cockroach and then on your way back you didn't find it? Yeah. <laughs> it's you know. Maybe you don't have cockroaches there in the UK, but uh, for us, you know, you, you kill a cockroach and you are like, yeah, I've killed it. On your way back, you see it going that way. That's mm -hmm. what has happened to these yeah. people who are ruling. We thought they were 
dead and gone and buried and they're still kicking. So I think we are all waking up to the realization that it's going to be a bit of a fight uh, for the next several months, at least. Um, the elephant in the room, uh, first before I come to that op uh, opposition, uh, or oh, Chile doing well, uh, I, I think I answered that. It's about yeah. leadership. Mm. It's about priorities. And finally, the elephant in the room, um, people are always asking me, Linda, if I could show you how my inbox looks, Mm. or the calls I get. Sometimes I actually get depressed by people, people than by my own personal perception of everything. But I will share with you one moment so that you can understand the reality that I face. Mm. One day we were at a function and I actually didn't know that a particular person had been appointed. And as we were joining the motorcade, I was in my little vits. <laughs> and uh, is that a colleague impounded? Uh, this there was a trending video, you, and I was driving that same one, yes, yes, my infamous V. And my colleague pulled up in a V8 burgundy color sunroof leather interior, oh, uh, private number plate. You know, where I was standing in my vids and I was mm. still shorter than their car. I'm exaggerating a little bit. Here. <laughs> and um, at that point, I'm just being very honest with you. Mm, a real moment. It, it, it hit me. Mm. I was like, wow. It's like that, right? Mm. So in that moment, I had a human moment. You know, yeah. I was just like, I do want to drive a VX2, mm. but if, if all my leadership aspirations are based on the vehicle I drive, then I don't mm. qualify as a leader. Absolutely. I don't. I didn't go in the bush for a VX, Linda. Mm. I went in the bush for freedom, for economic freedom, for liberties that no woman should carry a bucket on her way to giving birth at the hospital, mm. that no should be killed in her room because she was running away from a protest. She goes into a room and gets killed by a tear gas shot directly into her room in the life of Vespers. I went in the bush that all of us can be treated respectfully regardless of our fundamental convictions and the parities that we come with. Mm. And in that point, as I was lingering and in my dazed, myopic state, mm. I snapped out of it and closed my vits, tucked my jacket, and said, <laughs> you <"Dusted> your tie? <laughs> That's it. Fantastic. Um, so you're clearly sitting under the perfect feet, under the feet of Haka Inde Hichilema. And of course, you are a man uh, in your own terms, but these leadership characteristics that I see in him, are very uh, clear in you as well. Another message from uh, someone from diaspora, actually, uh, on, on my WhatsApp. Linda, please ask Nawa or tell him this. Um, we need to go in and help with the messaging. The administration is appearing so pale as if they are running out of gas already. The confidence and energy of the messaging is so low. Um, it's as if messengers... Uh, messages are marketing something they don't believe in, or the messengers are marketing something they don't believe in. This low energy of administration playing defense to uh, to the likes of Nakachinda, we are not defending and providing effective counter -nar narrative to the false narratives that are being broadcast out there. My God, this is an essay. I will not read the entire thing, but I think we get the gist of what he is trying to say. He sounds really cross, and I think um, you you have touched on that. I don't know if you wanted to add anything to this. No, I didn't touch Actually, on it. I just want to say thank you. Yeah, thank yeah. you for that feed. Uh, I'll, I'll take note. Thank you. Fantastic. The administration is looking pale and weak, apparently, according to this person. But um, like we said earlier, you have touched quite a lot on that. Now, what I'm, I'm going to switch things off a little bit so that we don't keep our guests for too long. Uh, welcome to TV Bakweto. If you've suddenly just 
stumbled upon us. I can see the numbers are increasing. Uh, you're probably just scrolling. You know, people just scroll on Facebook and they find this handsome, lousy man thinking, oh, I wonder what he's talking about. And they've decided to stay. Thank you for staying. Keep tagging your friends and keep um, sharing the link. We'll have a look at some comments from the viewers and then... Um, I'll pour in one last person from uh, the TV Bakwet family. Let's have a look. Who can we pick? Actually, it's quite interesting today. Usually you have like really angry questions. People adore you, Mr. Nawa. I can't find any sensible sort of... <laughs> They're just um, talking about positive things. They adore you. I can't even find... There's one comment. Uh, which says, I wish uh, government business should be communicated to the general public. I think it's the same same kind of uh, concern about the spokesperson, uh, the government spokesperson. And yeah, that's it. Let me just have a look and see if we have, oh, we have another family member who's just joined us. Moelo, welcome to the program. Uh, thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Hello. Um, and good evening, Mr. Movita. Good evening, Milo. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. Um, I've loved the interview and I've loved how you've come across and given us a bit of a picture of who um, our president is. And I was a little interested uh, to ask, probably inversely, um, I would say give us a picture, if you would, uh, of who the president is when he disciplines uh, somebody. I've been interested a bit to hear. <laughs> nice question. So, a, little, a little tucked, but that, that was my question. <laughs> Thank you so much. Mwerwa, so, sure. I'm, I'm even blushing just uh, talking about... Has, oh, even to add that, now, have, you ever been, have you ever been disciplined by the president? Well, Linda, and, and look, Linda, you're pulling words out of my mouth. And I, I was going to say to Mwelo that the best way to answer this question is to share my own personal disciplinary moments with him so that I share with... You know, I'm, I like being transparent. I believe mm -hmm. that public relations is about vulnerability, a little bit of vulnerability. It, it leads to connectivity. It leads to having a human moment and a, a sore tie of some sort that fortifies the convictions that we hold as a culture, as a society, and as a nation. Uh, so I'll share with you one moment that the president disciplined me. And, and that way you can have an idea of what kind of a leader he is. <laughs> the president is a very patient man, but the president enjoys communicating uh, a particular displeasure right there and then. You know, he's not one that will just want to hold off and, you know. Um, I, I'm going to share this story. I think I can share a little bit about it today without too many details. We were at Cathedral of the Holy Cross. Edgar Lungu was there. President Hakainde was there. And here I was running around. I won't go into the details and, and the nitty gritty. But the bottom line is was trying to get a meeting between President Hakainde Ichlema and Edgar Lungo. Okay? That greeting that you saw at that, uh, at that barrier of Dr. Kenneth Kaunda, mm -hmm. yes, that's what I was trying to do. So the first, the first attempt, Muelwa, did not go very well at, uh, at Cathedral of the Holy Cross. And uh, literally, I'll just say this because it's okay now, I believe. Uh, the team of Edgar Lungo agreed that we're going to meet HH. I had run around like a dog. Uh, and I went and told the president, I said, sir, this is what I'm doing. He says, Mwit, are you sure? I said, yes, sir. And uh, the president said, okay. And, and I said, so I'll come and they invite you when the time comes. And so when the time came for the president, the team of Edgar Lungo gave me a signal to say, you can now bring President Akainde to come and greet Edgar Lungo at Cathedral of the Holy Cross. You can imagine there are dignitaries. I'm running around like a dog. I go and stand up the president, Hakainde Ichlem, at that time president of UPND. He stands up and he starts to walk and I'm leading him towards Edgar Lungo so that they could greet. I mm -hmm. felt in my heart that at that time the country was tense and I felt President Edgar Lungo and President Hakainde Ichlem needed to greet for yes. the sake of peace in this country. Mm. I felt it. 
there were people around who didn't feel that way, but I bulldozed my way. Most of you don't know that I'm a, I make a little bully inside, you know. Uh, <laughs> It's it this smile that, can, <laughs> this smile that can take people, but I'm a little, I, I, I like to do, to get things done. Let's put it that way. So the president graciously agreed. I stand him up and we walk five steps, Mwewa and Linda, towards Edgar Lungu. And Edgar Lungu, President Edgar Lungu says, no, I'll greet them at the burial. What? And we have stood up. I have stood up, President Milupi, President Felix Mutati, President ha and President Heikendel is leading, I'm in front of him. The President Edgar Lungu says, no, I'll greet them at the, for some reason, I don't know, maybe it was a security detail, I don't know, it's fine. He says, I'll greet them at the, at the burial ground. I said, what? He says, yes, I'll greet them at the burial ground. I no. said, what? In my heart, <laughs> so what now? in my heart, I had a <laughs> Were they in Lozi, English, or Bemba? The curse words. I'll come to that on the next broadcast. So President Akainda is right behind me, Linda. And he, he looks at me and says, Muvita, what is happening? Mm. He said, Mr. Um, uh, there's a technical issue. What technical issue, Muvita? Mm -hmm. Linda, I, I can almost cry right now. I, that was the worst day of my life being around the president. Oh. I, I won't hide. And I, I just felt like I had dropped the world, never mind the ball. And, and I had to tell the president, I looked at the aides of President Edgar, and he was there seated like this, mm. looking at us. I said, what did you just do? So I go to President HH, I say to him, sir, please take a seat. I'll come and invite you later. Huh. Linda, it didn't take 40 minutes. He called me. Rita, <laughs> let's and just say I had a motivational <laughs> talk from the president. <laughs> <laughs> thankfully, thankfully, when we reached the memorial, uh, the burial site, everything happened. President Edgar Lungu was gracious enough. He came. And when President Edgar Lungu was greeting President H.H., I was right next to President H.H. And mm -hmm. uh, I don't even think, remember if President Edgar Lungu saw me. I don't know. But... It was a wonderful moment. I felt so good at the end of the day. Uh, and later on in the night, the president actually sent me a text and said, thank you. Oh, that's lovely. That is absolutely lovely. What an incredible story and a learning moment. I've never told, I've never told that story. That's a beautiful story. I think you should add that to your... Um, motivational speech or in your biography or autobiography as the case may be. Thank you so much, Mwelwa. Um, there is one last member of the family I'd like to add, but I'm not sure um, if they are here. I'll give them another chance. Wiseman, are you there? Ah, yes, yes, there. yes. Hi, welcome. Hi, hi, how are you, how are you Madam Linda? Hope you are getting me clear. Uh, yeah. There is a heavy lane here. Uh, we have been blessed with uh, Len Vumuvita. Kaiba PF, they were saying that uh, uh, Len has gone because of our party. And now God works. He, he has now slapped them in their faces to say, no, it is not your power and your 18th day of prayer, but I give Len when I feel like giving Len. And we thank God that we have got, uh, we have got Len now in Zambia. One hour, I've got uh, two questions for you. I'll be quick. Been the, been, I'm sure uh, the last, if not the least. Uh, the first question, uh, one hour, is that uh, uh, to my political career as a young guy, I think I've been admiring your steps. Uh, are you, are you, which position are you okay with on your personal capacity to work as at now, being appointed as civil servant, political appointment, or where you are right now? I'm saying this because I think uh, as UPND, uh, as a party, we are dying slowly. Most of the giants has been appointed and uh, the people to defend the party are not there. And uh, we need critical-minded people like you in as much as you want the appointment uh, to come to your side. So, so as at now, which position are you comfortable of serving on your own personal capacity? Secondly, uh, second and last question, sir. I wanted you to, to, make, a, to make me understand, again, on the personal capacity, 
Uh, previously, when we were in the opposition, I think uh, you used to encourage us. Every propaganda when the PF bring on the ground, you were there to defend the party and try to educate the people. But now, I don't know why, you are active on encouraging us how to become a landlord, which is a good thing in seven days and uh, the other things. You are very uh, active on that, and I always follow you on that. When it comes to educate the public about the propaganda being spread by the PF, you are not that on point. What is making you to, to be that? And you have to know in your mind, sir, that maybe President Akande HDMA has kept you as a shield for him not to be appointed up to now. Because most of us, we are waiting for the appointment. Now we are seeing, if you see, we see you, we feel comforted. Who am I? Then we feel comforted. Don't you think you are a shield for the president? Thank you very much. Sir. Wow, wise man. Linda, your, 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 your family is amazing. Absolutely touching. So searching questions. So searching. So I'll start with the last one, which is um, why have I been quiet? Um, uh, which for those that may be joining us, I have been quiet on purpose. On purpose. And those who know me know it takes a lot for me to be quiet. <laughs> uh, so I am proud of myself. It's it, it's really just to respect office bearers, our colleagues, and I wanted to give them time to settle so that when we start coming out to share ideas, to support the government, uh, we can just synergize and collaborate and work hand in hand. And you're going to see more of me uh, doing media appearances, uh, supporting different people in the communication side of things because I really love that. Like Wiseman has said, I'm quite good at it as well. You know, I, I enjoy it. Um, the second part, what position do I like the most in UPND? So I'll share with you an incident that happened on the day of voting, uh, on August 12th itself. I was on special duties at Kabulonga and the president and, he, and his wife were to arrive to vote, Linda. And we had been through a, an acrimonious period and. So I was coordinating with community house, the president house, and the, the detail we had set up, everything. The president arrives at Kablonga, Linda. My dear, there were about 12 lines at Kablonga. People left their lines to come and greet the president. And everybody was just saying, Bali, Bali, Bali. And my position that day, I want to share my position. The reason I'm saying this, mm -hmm. I was literally beside the president, uh, you know, there's always a, I can't go into details, there's always a, you know, you know, pattern and whatnot. So I was literally beside the president and our job was to usher him into there to vote and to usher him out. And um, that moment I knew he was going to win, that very moment. I knew with all, with, 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 with certainty that he was going to win. It was a tassel. My jacket got torn. I was right there. And there's a way we communicate with him, you know, when we're in that whole thingy and, you know. And so to answer Wiseman, I enjoy being around the president. I really do. I'm like a kid in a candy store. <laughs> I really, really love that man. And I absolutely support him 100%. And I know there are some people who are disappointed that I'm not disappointed. Mm. Um, Especially from diaspora, I must add. I've received so many messages, like I tell him that we, we held hands with him and with the UPND. Why hasn't the president given him a position? They are upset on your behalf. They shouldn't be. They shouldn't. They should be happy we're here now. And for me, I still serve the president up to now. And I still go, I show up at State House sometimes and other duties, I still, I'm still, i still around the president and I'm very happy to be around the president. Having said that, uh -huh. whatever the president feels, he's the, he's the leader, remember? Yeah. He is the captain of the ship. Whatever he decides on doing, including what he has already decided on, <laughs> sometimes you're waiting for a door to open when, in, when closing it is part of the decision or you're waiting for a door to close 
when opening it in itself is a decision. Absolutely. Whatever the president decides, Linda, or does not decide, I will, I will support him any day, anytime, anywhere. You, my friend, you're going places. Nyech Sengo, your comment, question for Mr. Nawa. Sure thing. Um, good evening, everybody, and good evening, Marita and Linda, of course. Um, good evening. Well, I, I really like your smile, one, and everybody does, especially <laughs> the people in my house. And um, yes, I'm Marita now, now. <laughs> I have to say, you are an amazing guy. And, uh, you know, oh. and my, my message to the president is that, you know, when the time come, the time comes for you to be awarded that, um, what do you call it, that um, role that he thinks very. I'm sure he has. That's why you know you're doing what you're doing, and I think I believe there's better things for you for you planned for you in the future, in the near future. Hopefully, not too far away. But um, I just feel you can you do a nice job. You did a lot of work. Um, for 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 the for the UPND before the pre for before the elections, that's how we all I came to know you, you know, because you were all over the place the election night, and you know, you you actually to me when I look at that, what you were doing on the election night, you were actually putting yourself in danger. You could you anything could have happened to you on that night, but you did it for the love of the country, for the love of UPND. My question to you though is. Where, where has all the UPND uh, people disappeared? It's all very, it's, it's quiet. We voted you guys in for you to do good, right? And I know it's already coming. We're seeing it. But where is the person to, um, to defend the president? What I'm seeing now in all the media houses, who are they interviewing? There's one particular guy that interviewed a guy without a brain. Is the way I can put it. He's every time you 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 put on the TV, he's either on the TV or he's you know in all the media houses, and they're giving him that enough talk time to even talk nonsense about the president. Where are you guys to defend our president? I think. And my other question is, Rita, in your last occupation, not when you were in the states, but before you went to the states, did you ever work as a police officer? That's my question. Thank you so much. And have a great Christmas if I don't get to speak to you again. Thank you. <laughs> Where do you start? I know. You're just saying we went to town with that. Um, <laughs> I'll start with the last part. Did I work as a police officer? No, I did not. Um, but I worked as a security guard for TDJ, if so that counts, when I was in America. And part of my job, part of my skill set that I bring around the president and is in relation to you know some of those kind of details and, and stuff like that. Uh, I've got some martial art things in me, different skills. Uh, you know, I can rip apart an AK-47. I can uh, I can fly a plane. I can do all sorts of things. So uh, I have quite a bit of you know survival skills uh, that I I cherish a lot. The other question when Yachisengu asked was, where have all the UPND people gone? Um, they haven't gone anywhere. They are around, but they have assimilated into day-to-day -day life. You know, four months is a long time um, to, to not know exactly uh, what your position in, on the bus is, for example. Uh, and if you're not strong enough, you can really wave and vacillate in between different worlds. And I think a lot of people probably just say, look, let me go back to my old stuff. Let me get myself busy whilst I wait for this, you know, and people uh, are still reconfiguring, recalibrating themselves. But I, I'm so happy that now that a few are coming up, a lot more are also coming up. Sometimes it takes one little, uh, you know, spring for the others to come out, so which is a very good thing. In terms of, um, you know, some people that are being given media platforms, I think we're going to counter that. We're going to balance that. And um, it's going to be an interesting end of December, end of year, and the beginning of next year will be absolutely fabulous. Uh, for the people in the diaspora, I just want to say thank you. Um, most of you don't know some of the risks we took, uh, whether it was that night we slept at Akainde's house when they were 
about to arrest him when we went to defend him at the house. Some of the things that went on the night of the elections, I can't even talk about them on the media. They were guns. Those people were armed to the core. And what they did know is we too, uh, at least my crew, I had about eight battalion crew. Uh, we had to, you know, to fight a thief, sometimes you have to think like a thief. Mm. And there are some big names I could mention that we overcame on that election night. And we had 18 people arrested in Lusaka alone. We had about 12 motorcades impounded on that night, loaded with cash and weapons, some of them. Uh, but we don't want to talk about these things because it's, you know, they're being handled at another level and would like to keep it like that. Fantastic. I feel almost terrible to have to shut this down because people just coming in, keep coming in. But we, all good things must come to an end. Uh, I would like to say a big, big thank you. I know you haven't been in hiding. I know what you've been up to and why you have been uh, keeping a low profile. But thank you so much. Um, having visited with us, this is your home. Come back, give us scoops. If there's anything exciting happening, you know you can always come back and uh, visit with us. Um, any last remarks that you may have or anything you'd like to share that perhaps no one else knows about what is happening, what the president is planning or what the UPND is planning? Just any nice tidbits to send our viewers with. First of all, I want to thank the Vakwetu, TV Vakwetu family for being trendsetters and for um, upping the game of communication and interaction you're so committed to this and dedicated to this. Your effort inspires us, even uh, silently. Even a doornail, by the way, uh, has an effort to cling to that door. And so just by looking at you, we see great possibilities in the future. And thank you for the role that you played as TV Vakweto, even leading up to the election. Uh, we just want to appreciate you. In terms of the greater picture of our nation, I believe that President Akainde Ichilema is interested in two groups. He's interested in the 2.8 million, the people that voted for him. He's also, he's also interested in the 1.8 million, the people who didn't vote for him. But there's a third group the president cares about, which is those who didn't vote at all. Mm. And I think if we can look at some of the decisions he is making, he will make he has to consider all these three groups. That balance is quite a new trend in the leadership style of Zambia, especially in contrast and comparison to the previous president who barely had press conferences, barely interacted with people, uh, was you know, almost always just doing his own thing if ever he did anything. This president needs our support. He needs our commitment, dedication, and goodwill as well. You know, even a good angel, if you keep saying to the angel, hey, your wings are too soft. Hey, why are you so white? You can't even be black. Hey, the angel will be like, are you sure you need me as your angel? Or do you want the devil to be back? Let's be grateful that mm. Zambia was delivered from the jaws of destruction. We will not worship these leaders, but we shall support them. And where they are wrong, we shall correct them and make sure that God protects and shields them. We are so fortunate to have such a good leader and he needs our support and to everybody, the 1.8, the 2.8 and the others, all of us 18 million, we are one Zambia, one nation. And that should be the pulse of our hearts, the creed of our conscience and the clarity of our vision. The footsteps we make in silence and the shadows we radiate in darkness because of the illumination of our conscientiousness, that should be the predominant nature and the redefinition of this Zambia. Perhaps through metamorphosis, we can create a new Chile, a new Dubai, a new UK, a new France. I don't know, but what matters is that we reach our fullest potential and that is heritage. Incredible. There's nothing more to add to that. All I can say, viewers, especially young people, you've got to be prepared for an opportunity before an opportunity presents itself. So it's time for you guys to roll your sleeves, start working and not be thinking, what can the government do for me? But start thinking, where can you place yourselves 
to help this Hichilema administration become successful and so that it can do the best that it's planned for you and me. Um, this has been a presentation of TV Bakweto, and I've been your host, Linda Banks. I've had Mubita Nawa. Um, conversing about various aspects of life, his uh, love life of all things, his uh, impending nuptials, the media, um, fewer subsidies. You can tell from the smile, the man is in love and we like a man in love. Thank you so much and good night. Adios, God bless you.